Welcome to this episode of Revolution and Ideology. I'm Nick. I'm Jared. This episode it was really sparked by a question from one of our Patreon supporters. They asked us the question, um, and we decided to just make a whole episode about it. So we don't have a strict, like, we don't have any notes or a lecture or anything planned like we traditionally do for most of our episodes. Yeah, there's so no formula gonna, here. We're going to rant. Yeah, we're just going to talk off the cuff and kind of address their question. So I'm going to start by reading the question. And then uh, we're just going to give our perspective on it. So this comes from our Patreon supporter, Zev. They ask, hi, Nick and Jared. I'm wondering whether you would consider sharing your personal philosophies of education in general or history education in particular. I'm currently in an education grad program training to be a K through eight teacher with a strong bent toward libertary social studies education. I've loved the way you've each occasionally spoken about the way you approach instruction and interaction with students. I'd be very grateful to hear slash read a fuller view of your ideas. So essentially, how we approach education, our thoughts on education, and so forth. So I don't know. How do you want to get started? So let's start with, um, I think we start with the critique um, of what the education system is right now. Now, granted, Nick or myself do not work in a K through 12 system. We work at the uh, collegiate level. Um, but what that means is we're fielding a lot of, we're fielding all students that have been, that are products of, of public education here in, in the United States. And, and of course, a few international students as well. But I guess what we're doing is we're kind of like, we want to critique what we're seeing as students kind of come in and, and, and how that affects our approach. It's not necessarily like the only effect, like both Nick and myself are going to teach the way we're going to teach regardless of, of who's coming in and how that's going to change with each generation, assuming we're going to be teaching for quite a while. Um, I did have a brief foray in public education for about two years when I was in graduate school. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I think it's important to talk about why we both teach higher education rather than a uh, K through 12 or something, because you, your goal was to do K through 12 in the beginning. Yeah, totally. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I got, you know, a bachelor's in history and then I decided I was going to um, uh, go through teaching certification programs, uh, a local, like teach it, like get your certification while you work and pass the, uh, the various tests. I can't even think of their names right now, more standardized tests, which we'll get to in just a second, um, which is alarming. But regardless, yeah, I was going to teach um, primarily secondary, like, so basically um, seventh grade uh, through uh, high school was my goal and see, see where I landed. And so while I was in grad graduate school, um, getting my master's degree, um, I started putting out feelers and trying to work in public education uh, locally here. And I ended up uh, at a lot of middle schools and a few high schools uh, guest teaching. And so some days I would do just the regular sub thing and be there for like one day, not really get to know the kids. And basically, uh, for lack of a better term, kind of babysit and make sure no one, you know, whatever. But here's the thing, even in those like single days, what I found is that these students, when I came in, especially when it was in my wheelhouse, when you sub, you, you actually can do anything like math or music or whatever, things that I know almost nothing about. But when I did end up in classes that were like social studies classes, I found that the students Students were like eager and hungry to learn even from the substitute and this isn't a critique of any specific teacher in general but what they told me is that like a lot of these these teachers are just like putting on like movies that are okayed by the state by the state of Colorado in our case and things like that and not really doing as much teaching and in the more advanced classes called AP classes there wasn't a lot of like engagement there as well. They basically were just preparing students to take a test at the end of the year. So um, when I got in there as a sub and I had an opportunity to like give them what might be a future like lecture based on what I was studying in grad school, they ate it up. I mean, on just topics that they'd never heard of from like the crusades they'd never heard of. And I'm not even like a medieval historian to, um, to things uh, about like the transatlantic slave trade or even like, you know, the, the, the American war for independence or things that you've probably all heard on our uh, very episodes myth is america but they would eat those up they were hungry for them see we all think that that, that, that students these days are lazy and just kind of want to like uh put on a movie and we'll they don't want that they don't want that they complain they're like we're tired of this they ask you about your life because they're curious you know students are always curious and and so i told them this is what i'm doing and they're like well can we hear about that what do you study and then then you just you're i'm almost giving a collegiate le lecture in an eighth grade classroom and these students are eating it up because no one's ever engaged them that way so that was one motivating factor is I learned that I like talking about these topics in ways um, that the students would be eager to learn. The second thing I learned is that um, uh, a couple of times um, uh, people, the, the, I'd be called to the quote unquote principal's office during these times. 
And uh, I, apparently I was teaching things that were not allowed to be taught. Like, you know, somebody wanted to know about World War II. So I spent the day, I think, in an eighth grade classroom teaching them about uh, what fascism was and how it took hold uh, specifically in 1930s Germany. And we talked a little bit about, um, you know, the, the Hitlers of the world and how easy it was for them to garner so many subscribers and those types of things. Anyway, I got called, to, apparently I'm not allowed to do that in, 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 in a public education system. And, and it's just, you know, that was really eye-opening. The second thing, or the third thing that motivated me to go um, higher ed than, than secondary was the politics at the public school level. There's so much nepotism and just like, I'm not really good, as you might imagine, any of you that have listened to this podcast, uh, of kissing ass and playing political, you know, playing nice politically and things along those lines. Like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And and I'm not going to check all of, of your boxes because your boxes are bureaucratic and so on and so forth. So, and, and I'm also not going to kiss your ass to make friends and, and all that other good stuff. So anyway, uh, without going too much deeper into like specific examples, because I don't feel like that there's a call for that. The bureaucracy, the nepotism, the, 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 the political, I don't even know what to call it, uh, whatever, you know, playing politics, I, I just couldn't do it anymore. It's not that there's not politics at, at, at higher education, but I feel like it's a little, it's different. It's a different level of politics, right? And, and I guess the fourth thing is, is parents, man, like, like that was real eye-opening eye to me. I guess I was called to the principal's office in that specific, specific example um, because I was uh, uh, challenging, I don't know, like whatever, whatever values they were trying to implement in their kids or something along those lines. Which again, keep in mind, this was not a, a little speech uh, advocating for fascism. It was actually a speech to the dangers of how easy it is to fall into something so disgusting as fascism. But yet, apparently this parent was trying to raise a little fascist. I don't know, what, whatever it is. But regardless, <laughs> like that led me to uh, uh, go into higher education. I completed my graduate degree and I guess I did an okay job um, because the university asked me the, the next semester to try out one class, see if I liked it and, and teach one class. And and the rest, they say back that was 2011, the rest they say is history and it's just kind of taken off from there. So that's me. That's why I moved from, from wanting to teach in K through 12 uh, to uh, higher ed. I'll talk about like my teaching philosophy a little bit later, but Nick, wh wh what's your story? Yeah, I had no illusions from the beginning that I would ever be able to teach in like K through 12. I knew for sure that I, there was no way that I wanted to deal with parents that I absolutely could not deal with that. Um, and the other is, at least in the state of Colorado, and I have to assume it's the same in every state in the United States, the curriculum is very rigid and dictated by the state in K through 12 education. So like you must use this book and you must use this curriculum. And on this day, you will be talking about this thing, right? And so that was completely unappealing to me. Also, since I was passionate about sociology, there's very few sociology courses that are taught in K through 12, which I think is actually a massive problem. But there wasn't really a place for me in K through 12 if I wanted to teach sociology and especially if I wanted to teach it the way that I was. And I knew that would be impossible uh, being restricted to like their curriculum without going. I would have to go way outside of that. Um, so like in higher education, at least where we teach, that doesn't exist uh, for the most part. Like I get to pick my own textbook and like my whole curriculum and syllabus, et cetera. I, we have full academic freedom which is, I think, hugely, hugely important. However, I'm not like trying to discourage anyone from teaching K through 12. Like those people are absolute heroes. We need better 100, teachers there. 100 yeah. percent. Like, yeah. yeah. They're, they're doing the lion's share. Like I, I exactly. they're doing things that I couldn't do, especially at the lower mm -hmm. level. Like, like when you're teaching kindergarten, you're not just like trying to teach the basics of, of reading and, and, and arithmetic. You're teaching these people how to be people, like little people. No, exactly. like, like it's yeah. such an amazing and difficult job. Like it is. And, 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 we're kind of in awe that people are able to do it. So and Jared and I actually have debates between ourselves of like, would we be changing people's lives more if we taught, if we were able to teach people at a younger age, right? If we were teaching high schoolers or something would the information that we convey in our classroom really hit home more sort of before they're really, really set in their political ways and so forth. And we're like getting in arguments and stuff instead of just like, yeah, I mean, that's basically it, right? If we were teaching them at younger ages, would we have more impact in the way that people think? And I don't know, there's no answer to that, but I think there's definitely an argument to be made that exposing people to specific types of information at a younger age has a bigger impact for sure. So that's a good segue for us to talk about like some very specific uh, critiques we have of the education system besides our own like little personal story. Like 
any sort of state sponsored education program. And when I say state sponsored, that could go all the way back to like ancient times when the state, right, dictated like what the tutors were teaching or there was challenges by like, you know, whatever, like, like sophists and things like, like anything that is advocated by the state must, it, it does not create, it will never create um, thinkers that are willing to challenge the system. The state would never advocate for that, right? Like the state only teaches things that so supports and perpetuates things that the state wants it to support. It's basically making cute little citizens that aren't necessarily really thinkers, but they're doers. And that's not unique to the United States. That's like age old, right? Like you're, you're basically, I mean, you're, you're, you're indoctrinating. That's what a state is. <clears throat> so. Um, I also wanted to like caveat that with, we oftentimes frame it or would like to think that it's like the State Department of Education is a bunch of like fascists, like you said, sitting in an office somewhere like, okay, if they use this textbook, they might revolt against us. But if they use this more conservative textbook, they will be in line with like, that's not happening, right? At least usually. It's more of just like, that is the way that systems work, right? A system that's in charge of education in this case, will just naturally impose its own norms and values and ethical beliefs, et cetera, on the curriculum. Like that's just how it's going to be. The people just naturally that occupy those positions of leadership are just naturally going to pick, right? It's not like there's some nefarious like backroom deals going on. That's just the way it happens, you know? So in, in, in doing that, what we've noticed, and it's actually gotten worse over time, you, we already have an episode on the, uh, the Trilateral Commission, and that might be where this comment comes from. Is that where it comes from? No, it was just a uh, random question. We're not going to revisit yeah. that whole thing. But long story short, the crisis of democracy and the Trilateral Commission, all of that led down, down a very dangerous road in terms of education with the creation of the Department of Education. And without going in too much uh, detail here, a lot of things came about because of this basically um, um, systemita systema systemata I can't even say the word, man systemization systemization of education at a federal level like the states still have quite a lot of i mean they have more autonomy than one might think but not as much as one might think it's it's kind of a, a gray area there regarding what can be taught and what can't be taught but long story short one of the things that happened and again really from the 19 like 70s on is the standardization of education is like the first critique we have of, of what we're seeing in the education system, like this whole standardization. Now standardized tests are like everywhere. But even when we were growing up, when I was a kid, like we had a few, but they didn't have like a lot of bearing on what was going on in school. I remember specifically one, I didn't live in this state. Yeah, I live in Colorado, but it was called like the Iowa test of basic skills mm -hmm. or something. I remember like that. that too. <laughs> yeah. And like it worked out. I mean, it, it got me into like a higher level something or other. I don't know, like some program or something where I got to go to a special room for like an hour a day or something with some other kids that were like also quote unquote special but that, that that's a whole other can of worms I, that needs to be unpacked regarding like that but anyway um like that was what i remember but by the time like i had my my own kids we're talking about like these like three state tests one federal test that they're doing every year what we're trying to do and i think what we're seeing here is with like this very positivist like change in the education system is we're looking to like measure and assess like every little bit of learning and we just know like innately like you cannot you can't place humans into like like rubrics like rubrics blow my freaking mind even like colleagues of ours are like all about rubrics you have to have rubrics no no rubric here's your basic instructions for your assignment and just rock out how you need to i'm not going to put little boxes on a sheet of paper and like a number attached to those little like what are we doing so they like that at our level because like we, they already are admitting basically defeat that students have been socialized or indoctrinated into thinking that way, that every, every question in life can be either answered true or false or A, B, C, or D. Like you've limited the amount of thinking that can take place. And the problem here is not even necessarily when that, that for us as, as social scientists, as like with math, right? Two plus two equals four, although I'm sure some sort of theoretical mathematician can find a way to argue that. And I would oh, totally receive that. I would actually eat that up. But, but when we start doing that with like the histories and the sociologies and the psychologies, if we're talking about high school classes, uh, cause I don't think they teach a lot of psych in, in, in third grade. But like when we start doing that, 
we're really, we're standardizing individuals into the way they think. It's not just the answer that we're indoctrinating with, whatever answer that is. We're indoctrinating them with a way of thinking that every question possible in life has between two and four answers. And there is no, no nuance there. I mean, I could go on and on, but I want Nick to chime in a little bit here. Yeah. I mean, we're creating like binary thinkers, right? There's one way of thinking and if you don't think that way, then you are wrong. It's a one or a zero. And I even get it from students. They're like, email me like, hey, do you have a rubric for this assignment before I do it? And I'm like, no, follow the instructions. And like they, they're at this point, they're so socialized into, like you said, the systemization thing, they can't function without very, very rigid guidelines of how they are supposed to do something, which I think is just evidence of, like you said, the K through 12 education system is socializing them into little boxes to fit into little boxes and to operate within these very rigid frameworks. And that does not lend itself to any kind of like critical thinking whatsoever. There's no thinking outside the box. There's no abstract thinking. It's, it's very, very specific. Obedience, obedience mm -hmm. from the early age after recess, if they even get recess anymore, which many schools have like just axed, but regardless, stand in line, you must be quiet for the 30 seconds. If the line is not perfectly quiet, you don't get to go back in the classroom, little, mm -hmm. little, you know, little guys. You don't get to go back in the classroom. You don't get, so stand in line. And then of course, after we do our little assignment that is dictated by the state, whatever state you're in, as well as the federal government, like we do this and I train you to uh, meet these very like whatever, arbitrarily decided upon. And I'm using that word intentionally, arbitrarily. I mean, education experts would argue, it's not arbitrary. We've done all these. No, it's, it's arbitrary. They, they are done within the context and under the dominant discourse of what you're trying to perpetuate now as society, not for the future, but for how it exists now. It's rather arbitrary when we really get down to it. But anyway, once they do that, they get a little free time and they get to color a picture inside the lines, color inside the lines, little Johnny or little Melissa or little whatever, right? Like color inside, like obedience. Obedience is what's being taught there. So we're simplifying the curricula to basically make them binary thinkers, as Nick said, and then we're teaching them to be obedient um, from the very earliest age. It's, it's a recipe for disaster, and it basically kills critical thinking. And creativity, by the way. And creativity. And, and, and don't us get, even get us started, but we could at least cite this real quickly. The slashing to arts programs, the slashing to athletics programs, the slashing. Why are those the first to get slashed? And no offense, STEM lovers, but like all the money's then being diverted to STEM. And I'm not going to sit here as a human sciences person on my like soapbox and say, we don't need to learn science and math and tech. We do need to learn those things. Absolutely. But they must not take precedence over everything else because then you're, you're creating simpletons, simple minded thinkers that don't ask questions of the larger social world that they're around or the artistic world or the creative world or the athletic world or whatever world we already know there's at least seven different types of learning and we're focusing on like part of one right well and i've always found it ironic that in an economic system that supposedly absolutely values innovation above all else our whole education system is really designed to weed out anyone that thinks outside the box nonsense and yeah, I look think at the that... top 10 like worst majors that are listed by these econ mags mm -hmm. you know the forbes of the world it's always the human sciences it's always anthropology or history or what or, or or art history or whatever and you're like oh you can't make money at that that's the only assessment but that then when you attach the money piece that's what we're talking about we're, we're talking about measurable assessment which is impossible to to actually do. You can't actually do those things. You cannot measure a people, a, a person's individual growth or learning habits or whatever through the standardization, nor can you measure it through, um, through monetary wealth that they may earn later in life, right? Well, like, and I that think that- That doesn't measure the quality of a person or their education by any stretch of the imagination. It's actually embarrassing to think about it like that way. Seriously. Once standardized testing came and comes to dominate the education system, then I think the actual like real learning takes a back seat because the only thing that is taught ever is essentially how to excel on the test, which is just absolute nonsense. I mean, so many things are not taught because they're not on the test, right? So you learn very, very, very selective information that appears on a state standardized test, and you learn how to take that test. That's really the education you're getting. 
Right. right. We've got some data that we actually had compiled from an article that we were writing and have since abandoned at this point due to various frustrations with the whole thing. And, and nobody's going to listen anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So we have, but we still have the data here. So there, here's some interesting data. So um, real quickly, right now, actually, I'll, I'll give you a date on this in a second. The National Center for Public Policy and Higher Education finds that every year in the United States, nearly 60% of first year college students discover that despite being fully eligible to attend college, they're not ready for post-secondary studies. So if K through 12's goal is to try and get students ready for some sort of career path, much of which now includes a, a higher education, um, a path through higher education, right? Whether that's a trade school or a university, right? And everything in between, 60% of students are coming out of this K through 12 system wildly unprepared for any of it, like absolutely any of it. Which like we can both attest to, right? And even within our careers, which are, we're both in our, our 10th year at this point, we both noticed just an incredible decline in, on average, of students' readiness for university level work. It wasn't even as bad as it is now, 10 years ago, you know? The study I really liked way all the way back in 1993 before this got so out of hand. And it was put together by uh, Fred M. Newman and Gary uh, Wellage. Hopefully I'm pronouncing it right. But they wrote something called the Five Standards of Authentic Instruction. And it was for authentic learning uh, way back in 1993. This is what they found in their study, though. Um, they found that they, first thing they did is they, they broke everything up into two different categories that, that happen in K through 12. Low order thinking and high order thinking. So the first thing they, do, they, they, they recognized is they want to actually, excuse me, define these things. So let's define these things. Low order thinking or what they call lot occurs when students are asked to receive or recite factual information or to employ rules and algorithms through repetitive routines. As information receivers, students are given pre-specified knowledge ranging from simple facts and information to more complex concepts. Students are in this role when they recite previously acquired knowledge by responding to questions that require recall of pre-specified knowledge. So what do you think of lot? What is lot, Nick? I mean, this is like root memorization, essentially. That's what it is. Recalling of facts that have been just dumped into your brain that you're supposed to remember because you just repeat some exercise endlessly to remember them. Right. From another study, uh, a, a researcher uh, named Zemansky found that, and I quote, it's a sad irony that teachers relying on rote memorization and basic fact recall to improve student achievement or standard on standardized tests are actually practicing the opposite of research shows is good teaching. So again, what we're finding in this study, uh, that study dates back to 2014. So, I mean, we, we had at that point, what is that? I can't even do the math on that because my education wasn't so good. 21 years, 21 years of studies and they came to find that standardized education was not doing any of the things that it was supposed to be doing. Standardized testing was not making better students or better learners. It was hurting them in 21 years. Yep. Well, and the funny thing is like everyone knows this at this point, right? There is not a single study that proves that standardized testing actually improves the learning and education of students. But the government is so bureaucratic and so driven by it systemization that it, it, it's still a thing you know what i mean they haven't repealed this or somehow modified this really at all from that same study in 2014 the national council of english teachers found instruction is also diminished by mandatory curricula that have been developed to prepare students for standardized tests in some cases mandated curricula come with scripted lessons and or pacing guides that determine when specific content should be taught leaving teachers limited opportunity to make instructional decisions what we find in this quote is not just that like we, we, we get to continue to shit on standardization, but what I also want to focus on is the, is the fact that when we are critiquing right now, we're not even really critiquing the teachers themselves as much as the system. I'm willing to bet there are millions of amazing teachers that are basically shackled, right? So it's not really Mr. or Mrs. Jones you know, in sixth grade, whatever civics class that is the problem. It's the fact that Mr. and Mrs. Jones or Mr. and Mrs. Jones are shackled by this standardization and curricula. They don't I mean, get to be, be honest, the amazing teachers. There's zero people throughout history that have gone into primary education and secondary education that are like, I cannot wait to graduate from grad school so that I can go into a seventh grade history class and put on a movie. Like that is, that's not a thing, right? Like they want to change people's lives. They want to educate people. They want to help them be you know, better and succeed. But like you, the term you use is perfect. They're just shackled by this curriculum and this standardization and the, 
systemization and corporatization of education, for sure. What are we missing based on this study that I just cited? That's the high order thinking or what they call hot. So in contrast to lot, hot, high order thinking requires students to manipulate information and ideas in ways that transform their meaning and implication, such as when students combine facts and ideas in order to synthesize, generalize, explain, hypothesize, or arrive at some conclusion or interpretation. Manipulating information and ideas through these processes allows students to solve problems and discover new meanings and understandings. When students engage in hot, an element of uncertainty is introduced and instructional outcomes are not always predictable and thus cannot be in a box rubric, right? Mm -hmm. So they're arguing essentially, and this again, it was back in 93 in this specific study that I'm citing, you can't do this. Like we're not teaching any hot, we're not teaching any high order thinking, nothing is being accomplished. And again, like there's a reason for that right? It could be considered dangerous. It could be considered dangerous to create critical thinkers. So that's important. Even from a quote from the study, modern education too often focused on memorization, compliance, and endurance rather than critical thought. Well, I think there's also just, this just made me think of, there's a, wide, a huge and widening divide also between private schools and public schools. And we know the economics behind it is just one thing, but also the type of education that's received at the schools because the private schools do not rely on the state for their funding. So they don't have to do the standardized testing. So they're more free to teach this type of high order thinking and sort of outside the box and et cetera. And then so when people like you graduate from a private school or a public school and you're applying to university or then in the future applying to a job, these two classes of individuals have wholly different skills. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. And even, I mean, we jobs, I mean, that's a great example, right? Now we know that the algorithms are set for like, like these job, uh, uh, the software that just basically just weeds out everybody that doesn't have the right resume or answer the right questions. Mm -hmm. Because like, I mean, you're supposed to be trained to be able to do the thing, not that you want to do, not answer the questions the way you want to, answer them the way the system wants you to, whether that's the education system, or if you're trying to get a job uh, as a cashier at Kohl's, like you have been socialized right? To answer questions a certain way and not the way that you want, the way that they want, right? We're, and it, now we're back to obedience again. That's what standardization also leads to. It's a lack of critical thinking. It's binary thinker. It's, it's obedience, all of that. Okay. So now second critique, and this will now be more specific to Nick and I's disciplines of sociology and history and, and other social sciences that we're familiar with because we've had to be, you know, philosophy and so on and so forth. Um, narrative. Uh, there's a term that I use over and over again in every episode. We even have two standalone episodes or little shorties explaining what it is, but it's, it's, I use the term because it just seems to fit and it's simple, right? It comes from a political scientist named Rogers M. Smith, and I'm going to beat that till it's dead. But he, he argues that, you know, what societies do to socialize individuals to being compliant is they tell stories and those stories are called ethically constitutive stories. They teach the subjective notion of right and wrong for that society. They're constitutive in that they're socially binding, i.e. you are part of this and you're going to do this. Like, and it's taught to us in a story form, a narrative, quote unquote, because that's way more entertaining and you absorb it without realizing you're absorbing it as a quote unquote lesson. So that's why we do those things. Well, for Nick and myself, the most powerful ethically constitutive story we find ourselves battling are the, the ethically constitutive stories of the social sciences. Of, of, of teaching versions of how the past, at least for me as a historian, and Nick can chime in with sociology here in just a moment, of how we got here today. And it is just so wide, wildly obfuscated. There's wrongful omission. The angles usually only come from dominant white men. And I mean, we could do this all over, just over and over again. We for, fail to recognize the true horrors of everything from transatlantic slave trades to um, oppressive uh, foreign wars to I don't know, wars on the poor. I mean, we like, I mean, listen to any other episode and you'll kind of pick up on what we're talking about. But the narrative in the education system is shaped that way. So by the time a person leaves that education system and then they enter the real world and they meet somebody with a different viewpoint or that has a different experience, and to be blunt, this is usually gender and racially, like this, this is where you start to see the divide. And all of a sudden you're saying, well, that's not what I learned. I learned that everything my people have done is amazing and we're the best thing that's ever existed. And uh, yeah, like, and, and so when they're faced with this, they just, they cannot handle it, right? Well, and I think it links to 
the, just the complete inability to hold an opposing idea in your mind and think about it without somehow feeling like your entire life is being offended and challenged, right? Like uh, many of our students just completely lack the ability to think like, okay, this is an alternate viewpoint. Let me think this through and sort of chew on it and think how I feel about it and maybe do some research on my own and how does this impact how I believe and like, okay, great. And then come to their own conclusions, right? Oh, I don't agree with that at all. Or wow, yeah, that made me think of this in a unique way. Or like people are just completely unable to do that. And the problem it, here is that the, the teachers now, and we can fault them a little bit because the teachers now, it's been a couple of generations since a lot of this was implemented. They, were, they went through the same education system at this point. So they are also socialized into single track thinking. They mm -hmm. cannot see outside the box to save their damn lives, right? Like, and this is where standardization makes its way into the human sciences. Essentially, students are only taught a singular narrative to how the world works. There's one lens to history. It usually starts um, uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, sometimes if we're lucky, you'll give credence to maybe like a Babylon or an, or, or, or an Egypt in there. But no, it starts in Europe. It's very Eurocentric and, and white driven and male driven and so on and so on. There's one version of history. It's a singular narrative. There is no respect for other political structures or economic systems. And when you are in maybe seventh grade, briefly introduced in your world history course, I think that's when they teach it in our state is in seventh grade. You're given like, like the entire continent of Africa is given like a chapter in a 15 chapter textbook. The entire continent of the literal birth fucking place of civilization is given one chapter. What we're doing is we're now applying that standardization of single track thinking or binary paradigms or right and wrong. And we're now applying it to the stories of how we got here today. No, I fully agree. Not to mention the main thing that I think about a lot is just the absolute celebration of neoliberalism and how presenting anything that even remotely critiques that at the most superficial level is just met with such resistance. I mean, and the students don't even know if you ask them, like, do you believe in neoliberalism? They would have no idea. They couldn't respond to that question. But they know when you're attacking that. I, I mean, it's almost like just internally, they they buy into it so much that if you critique it at all, I mean, like just me mentioning Karl Marx in my classes is like blasphemous, right? People like cannot digest this. And it's like, oh, but Stalin was bad. And there were bread lines and gulags. And I'm like, bro, like Karl Marx was a century before that happened. And none of this, like none of Karl Marx's thinking has anything to do with like what happened in the Soviet Union. Like I literally one time, had a student, they read the manifesto of the Communist Party when we were talking about Marx and capitalism and communism and so forth. And a student was like, I was printing this out in the library. And like, I was just so nervous standing at the copier thinking that like, at any point, someone was going to come like arrest me or something. And I'm like, it's just a pamphlet, basically. It's a long pamphlet. It's not that big of a deal. Like it's, and then the same student was like, well, yeah, I read this. And there's like nothing about gulags anywhere in this thing. And I'm like, oh my God, like yeah, the, the narrative has just been so skewed in one direction that it's, it's just similar ilk, right like it's the same thing when we look at like us history and we get you know we, we raise eyebrows there by pointing out and we've done it in this series like yes it, it, these are facts george washington ordered the execution of his own troops like some two at least 200 of his own troops yes he ordered the ethnic cleansing of the iroquois league of peace and power that is a call for genocide Right. And, and, and this, that's not his entire character. That's not what we're insinuating, but it is okay for us to like, look at things and, and, and reveal these facts. Did Joseph Stalin do awful things? 100% he did. Yes. Did George Washington or name your other great white hero do horrible things? Yes, they also did. What, and I guess what, what we're finding is that the way that the ethically constitutive story is painted in the K through 12, and then of course, further exacerbated by popular culture and media uh, and symbolism and Mount Rushmore's and all that other stuff is that, that people can't wrap their little brains around it because they've never been given the opportunity. They have, they've been stuck on low order thinking for so long and binary paradigms that there, there's just no critical engagement available, right? Like, and that's, that's one of those things that is a direct product of the K through 12 system, basically just like more than anything, right? So, uh, I mean, history often overlooks certain people, ideas and events while emphasizing others. History is, and I say this at the beginning of every semester, 
never objective. It cannot be. You cannot take mathematic or scientific objectivity. We could probably argue if, if they can be objective either. But regardless, I don't feel like having that argument right now. You cannot apply those to the social world. They do not work. There is no objectivity in history, right? One example I provide is uh, something we can all agree upon. There is an objective part of what happened on uh, December 7th of 1941. Japanese airplanes bombed um, um, the United States Navy at Pearl Harbor. That happened. We can agree that happened then. But all of the context around why, how, ramifications, that's all subjective. If you are American, you have been taught a very specific story. And that's fine. That story is correct. If you're Japanese, you have been taught a very specific, specific story. But that story is also correct. Here's the one that, that, that neither the Japanese or the United States, and this is what usually blows students' signs. If you are Hawaiian, you have also been taught a certain story and have a very strong um, opinion about what happened in this battle between two colonizers over your land, right? Like, the, that's just three versions of the story. There's probably more. Which one is right? Why can't they all be right? Mm -hmm. And students don't have that ability anymore because of what's being produced in the K-12 through system. Yeah, we're all taught so much that there is one truth, right? That there can only be one truth. And we completely, especially like you said, in the social studies, cannot operate in a way where there there's no room for multiple truths that cannot exist, right? And subjective experience and so forth. And then conflating actual mythology with history, right? Paul Revere's ride. That's mythology. It's a it's a poem written by Henry Longfellow before the Civil War, like almost 100 years after Paul Revere's ride would have actually happened. It's not true, but we teach it as history. Now, it's not some sort of dangerous myth, like the world's not going to end because we don't know the truth behind Paul Revere, but that's the point we're making. If we're willing to conflate mythology, this ought George Washington and the cherry tree. Um, I don't know. There's probably numerous other examples uh, that I can't think of right now off the top of my head. These are, like, this is the conflation. This is celebratism that is being taught in history classes further muddying the waters of what's real and what's not. I'm Googling for a book right now that I just thought of. I think it's on my bookshelf, but it might be in my office, but I'll find it real fast. Um, there's an author that has a book that's about the foundational myths of the United States. And it's not like, it's just a really, really good example. Um, of like like jared said it's not like who cares if you believe in the paul revere myth like that's not damaging to anyone but it's just a perfect example of like how these like half truths become known as fact the book is called founding myths stories that hide our patriotic past and it's by ray Raphael, and it's just a bunch of examples of like speeches taking place and events happening and all these things like that we take as like canon and absolute truth in the founding of the United States that absolutely did not happen. They happened on a different date or they didn't happen at all how they're told in the history books and et cetera. It's just a really good example of like, these are things that we've taken in the myth th that are myth that we've taken as fact in the foundation of the United States. It's just a really good example of, and he talks about the impact of this and how it happens and why and so forth. There's so but many, that's a there's good so point. many, there's so much to undo in a, a freshman level collegiate course that I, it's almost exhausting how much you have to undo, how much programming you have to do and how much little like fact checking you have to do on, on, on basic things, the Pocahontas story. Like I, like at this point, like, and in, in this case, I get, I can't even blame K through 12. I'll blame Disney, I guess on this one, but like even having to fix that little story there, because that story does have ramifications. It teaches mm -hmm. a wrong history it teaches the history that whites and native americans were going to get along and that, that 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 a romantic relationship that never actually happened it didn't even remotely come close to happening um somehow means that these different cultures were going to eventually be able to mix and we'll just overlook the next like four centuries of ethnic cleansing because of this beautiful and you're teaching children that from like the youngest age so then in 20 uh whatever 17 or 16 somebody correct me in the comments if i'm wrong when native americans are protesting for clean water in the dakotas and and, and a pipeline not to run through the reservation People are like, well, what are they so upset about? Everything's been so great for them for the past four centuries. Like it's it, Pocahontas, it's, it's all been amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 unreal. Even the Thanksgiving Day myth, right? Like the real Thanksgiving, the first Thanksgiving happened. Nobody knows what happened on the second Thanksgiving. King Phillips, uh, Medicom, like a Native American uh, in, insurgent at the time, whatever. They they think they, they they were giving thanks around his severed head. That's what the Pilgrims were doing because they killed him and his people. 
I mean, that was the genesis, really, of our Myth is America series on this program is to tell those stories that often are completely overlooked. Because we're trying to write education. a narrative that doesn't, again, create critical thinkers. It creates people that are loyal to the state, subservient mm -hmm. to the state. And again, not thinkers, but doers. Don't think, just act, right? And yep. act in accordance to what the state has dictated down to you. Just follow directions. Just sit in your cubicle. Just do the Excel spreadsheet like this with this template, right? It's so here's a collection, just a real brief collection of things that 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 I again and 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 what we when we were originally going to write this article that I had collected, just examples of how much the state cares about protecting the celebratism of the United States ethically constitutive story. It's just a short collection of like things that they were willing to do to kind of protect that, that myth making of everything that it means to be here, right? And, and its creation story. And actually before I begin that, you need to link and give a shout out to um, the invention of American tradition. How did we not just cite that now? Mm -hmm. But yeah, that, that's a, an amazing critique of how this started. It's a wonderful article. Actually, uh, let's do, we'll do an episode on that coming up at some point too. The invention of American tradition. Okay, sure. anyway. Eric Hobbs. All right, so way back in uh, 2010, there was an Arizona House Bill 2281, which in response to classes and programs that taught students about the exploited histories and experiences of minorities in the United States, um, the Arizona House um, uh, uh, drafted this. It prohibited classes that promote the overthrow of the US government, promote resentment towards a race or class of people, or are, are designed primarily for pupils of one ethnic group or advocate ethnic solidarity. The first one, any state would pass. I get it. You're not gonna teach students how to whatever, have a revolution against their government. Fine, I'm willing to let that one pass. However, however, also banning these classes from teaching any sort of, or that could potentially promote resentment toward a race or a class of people. So if you're, this is in Arizona. So if you're Latino or if you're First Nation or if you are African-American or if you are a woman or whatever, like, and you learn the true history of what happened to your people and that leads to resentment. Well, so what? That resentment is justified, at least in our minds. Like, but it made, they made it illegal. They're, pro they're basically protecting white male tears there. They don't want white men crying. Mm -hmm. is, I mean, is that what they're doing there? Yeah, for sure. White, they're, they're protecting white supremacy. I mean, let's just say it what it is. Right. Um, they don't want classes that are designed primarily for pupils of one ethnic group. Well, they're not designed that way. If you have a Latino history class in a high school, anybody can take that class just because you know that maybe uh, certain other groups might not want to take it because they don't care about that history. They've been told it doesn't matter. So be it, but you, you can't have a Lat Latino uh, history class in Arizona because of this, right? Or advocate ethnic solidarity. You don't want ethnic solidarity. Well, what have we been learning to this point in history, right? So anyway, that's one easy example. You have anything else on that Arizona house bill? No, not at all. In 2014, the Republican National Committee likewise called on Congress to withhold funding from the nonprofit that developed the course, the College Board, because its AP course emphasizes ne negative aspects of our nation's history while omitting or minimizing positive aspects, end quote. Holy shit, I know the AP curriculum very well. Um, I've had two, two of my own kids literally go through US AP US history. Um, it, it's, it is anything but, I mean, it is completely celebratory of the United States, but apparently not celebratory enough for what is going on here. They wanted to get rid of the AP courses in general because they're not celebratory enough of the United States past. Thoughts? Uh, yeah, it's disgusting and it's completely ridiculous. I mean, we get, we're getting, I want to say like a half truth, but it's not even a half truth. We're getting like a 16th version of what history actually is. You know what I mean? That same year in the state of Colorado, where we live, in a county just to the north of us, the Jefferson County School Board faced student and teacher walkouts when the newly proposed advanced placement U.S. history co curriculum asserted that, and I quote, material should pro promote citizenship, patriotism, essentials and benefits of the free enterprise system, respect for authority and respect for individual rights. Material should not encourage or condone civil disorder, social strife, or disregard of the law. Instructional material should present positive aspects of the United States and its heritage." End quote. Now, students walked out on this. They literally held a three, four-day walkout, I don't remember exactly, and their teachers walked out in solidarity. But I must stress, this is what they were proposing. This school board proposed materials that only promote citizenship, 
patriotism, like our, our, here's the thing. We posit ourselves as like the land of like free speech and free thinkers and you could do it. That's not freedom. That is the antithesis to freedom when you are promoting only one way of thinking, respect for only one country, the essentials well, and, the and benefits of the free- is what gets me too. The essentials and benefits of the free enterprise system. So like no other economic system is relevant in the world, which is fine, I suppose. Like there's never been another economic system apparently, I guess. Uh, I mean, the only way to do things is to um, uh, is to have exploitative uh, hierarchy, I guess, apparently. That's the only way you can spur on an economy. I mean, humans didn't do it for hundreds of thousands of years beforehand. Who knows? Capitalism's been around, what, 300 years? It's doing a hell of a job on the planet, isn't it? Moving on. Um, respect for authority, absolutely appalling. Like, really, like, respect for authority and respect for individual rights. Can you have both? It does yeah, that's a whole other respect episode. individual rights. It clearly, here's the irony. That's the hypocrisy in it. You're teaching students one way of thinking. You're not respecting their individual rights. It's absolutely hypocrisy written into the proposal. Mm -hmm. Material should not enco encourage or condone civil order. This is the most dangerous part, actually, for why the students walked out, is because it, material should not encourage or condone civil disorder. That line right there would give a green light to removing a Dr. King from the curriculum because that's civil disorder. Mm -hmm. It would give the green light to removing an Emma, Go I guess they don't even teach Emma Goldman. I was about to say Emma Goldman, Alice Walker. Who, I, I was trying to think of, do they? Rosa Parks, Malcolm X, right? We I mean, I guess on. it's all civil rights related, but I'm trying to think. They Susan B. Teach. Anthony. Really. Yeah, yeah, Alice Paul. Yeah, um, yeah all that. Alice Paul, let's, let's be yeah, they don't teach Alice Paul. She's too hard. Yeah. Um, okay. Anyway, yeah, no encouraging or condoning of, of, of civil disorder, no social strife. So if you have a bone to pick with society, do not advocate for yourself. Let the system correct itself. Maybe you'll be dead when it finally does, but who cares? Uh, it will maybe eventually. Or disregard of the law. Well, laws are authority and they're written from the top down, not for the benefit of those at the bottom, but for those of the benefit that are the law writers. So again, the last part, instructional material should present positive aspects of the United States and its heritage. Oh my God. Th like that's indoctrination for lack of a better term. It's not that everything, we're not sitting here standing that everything about this country and its past is horrible. We actually don't necessarily believe that, but you have to teach all of it. You cannot only teach the good or else you are not engaging in creating high order thinkers. You're creating low order thinkers. Plus like I would much rather I would much rather have a student, let's say, that knows as much as you can possibly know about the real history of the United States and still love the United States, still be a patriot, than someone with this false illusion about the United States as like completely unblemished, just amazing country and be like the biggest patriot ever. Like that's just, that's an illusion. 2015, moving forward. Oklahoma in their house introduced Bill 1380, which aimed to remove AP US history from the state altogether. Um, and, and, and I actually never followed up because we stopped, uh, we let this article go, but like I never followed up if it actually happened. But the fact that the entire state of Oklahoma is like, well, AP US history, just don't need to learn it. Just, it's not, it's not necessary. Like right. that's just wildly alarming, wildly wrong. In 2017, Arkansas, House Bill 1834, Arkansas, surprise, surprise, um, sought to prohibit the work or thoughts of U.S. historian Howard Zinn in all public or state-funded charter schools. So Arkansas targets one historian, Howard Zinn, of course, his most famous work is The People's History of the United States, um, and we use parts of it in classes here and there. But it's just, a, it's, he's just an individual with an opinion on, on the past, and he's actually pretty patriotic. He just shows the other side. He creates new heroes. He makes heroes out of laborers, out of women, after uh, people of color. He turns them into the heroes in his stories. So like, but... They sought to prohibit it in an entire state. That one failed, but the fact that they proposed it in the land of the free and the home of the brave, freedom of speech, First Amendment, absolutely embarrassing. These are just a few examples, like real quickly, that we had compiled as we were putting this together. But like, this is how much control certain individuals want over, especially the human sciences. Well, and I just want, I think it's just evidence that how dangerous free thinking is to the status quo. It's evidenced by the lengths that the government will go to try to prevent it from happening. 
there's a great quote that we found when doing research for the, the again, the, the forever unpublished article, so don't ask for it, but um, from a dude named Ken Burns. And he's pretty famous. He makes all of the most amazing documentaries on the Civil War in Vietnam. And I think he did one on baseball, am I right? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, he had this to say, um, because his, 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 his documentaries show good, bad, black, white, gray, all of it. They, they, it's everything. It is everything. He tries to tell a complete story, and that's why they're so long, but he's trying to tell the complete story and not sugarcoat it. He says, somehow in recent times, the humanities have been needlessly scapegoated in our country by those who continually benefit from division and obfuscation. Let me make it perfectly clear. The United States of America is an enduring humanistic experiment. So, I mean, we could go on and on with numerous examples, but at this point, I think we've kind of like codified like the critique. Do you have other critiques, corporatization, yay, nay? You want to throw that one in there? Um, I think that really applies more to the university system, really. This like, who are the customers of education and funding allocation and so forth? It's probably less so at the unit at the like. But it's definitely something. Even though that, they're electing business people into like like the the school boards and the that uh, is a huge issue is the, the way uh, the school boards I can't are think of the word what are they the, who runs the school districts again why can't I think of the freaking title superintendent thank you superintendents yeah yeah they're not they're not they're, they're not electing a lot as many uh, people with like rich educational experiences no I mean even people. the past president of the CU system before our current one was an oil executive right I mean he had no. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, uh, well, I mean, in fact, we can even go back to the previous um, secretary of education and so forth. Right. Right. Um, these are leadership positions that are hugely, hugely important that are being filled with people with zero experience in, in education whatsoever. Okay. So that doesn't answer our Patreon question at all. It just gives us a chance to rant about everything so rather than the Lego movie, everything is awesome. Everything sucks. Um, no, um, that doesn't answer the question. So his question was more oriented and you'll have to remind me a little bit of his verbiage, but like, okay, so what do you two do? What is like, what, what, what do you do? Yeah, what are your per personal philosophies of education in general or history education in particular? Um, I love the way you've each occasionally spoken about the ways you approach instruction and interaction with students. So what do you got? So I, I think back to a point that was kind of a turning point for me, which was interesting because it only happened a couple of years ago, where I, every year at the university where we teach in the sociology department for the grad students, they have a pro seminar and the grad students, um, every incoming grad students required to take this course. And as part of the course, everyone that teaches in the department comes through and like talks about their career and what, what they do and stuff. And so I always go in once a year to talk about what it's like being an instructor because I'm not a professor, I'm just a, a, an instructor. And so what is it like to do like the non-tenure track and so forth? And like, what is, how do I teach and stuff like that? And one of the grad students asked me one time, like, do you think that it's important to remain neutral as an educator? And in the moment I was kind of like, didn't know how to respond because my answer is absolutely not. It is impossible, and I do not care what anyone says, it is impossible to be politically neutral at any time, but definitely not in the classroom. Um, I think it's Howard Zinn's quote that like, it's impossible to remain neutral on a moving train. Every, and Frederick Jameson, right, talks about how every act is a political act. And I think we need to get away from the discourse of like, don't bring your politics into the classroom or don't bring your politics into your job. Don't bring your politics to dinner. Like that's every single act, where you work, where you teach, how you teach, what you teach, where you eat dinner, et cetera. All of those things are political acts. So it's non, it, it's impossible. I don't expect anyone to be a neutral educator because it's impossible. So the conservative economics professor that's teaching neoliberal education, I, th that's what they do because that's what they believe. And like, I might not personally agree with that. That's fine. And they definitely don't agree with what I'm teaching. But to expect someone to be neutral in the classroom, I think is the problem. And so no, I am not a neutral educator by any means. My I try to be as radical in the classroom as absolutely possible without getting fired. That's my goal. And I try to critique 
the dominant discourse and the mainstream narrative of the status quo in the classroom as much as possible, obviously within the confines of like what I'm teaching, right? Like I'm not, it's relevant to the class very clearly, but I intentionally create classes that give me the power to do so. So like Jared and I teach a class called Resistance and Revolution, where we have the freedom in the curriculum to talk about strategies for how to overthrow our government, as an example. Or I just made a new class that I taught for the first time, was it last semester, called State and Society. And it's an upper division sociology class where we break down philosophies of and formations of the state and state discourse and what is a state and how do they come into being and citizenship and refugee crises and like so forth, all of these things to critique the status quo and the dominant narrative. And for me, it's really a personal thing where, and this came along early on in my career when I was trying to figure out if I wanted to teach or not and like what it was like and then evolved over time of like, for me personally, as a white male, if I'm going to occupy that position in the classroom as the educator, I, by putting my body there and having that job and choosing that career path, am essentially filling that spot that could otherwise be filled by a person of color or a woman or et cetera, right? Any other minority voice that could be voicing other things in the classroom. So if I'm going to occupy that spot, I take it very seriously that it is my duty as an educator to speak that voice as much as possible, as much as I can, and to use curriculum and sources in my classroom that speak that voice as well, and to radically challenge the status quo as much as I absolutely can, like I said, without getting fired, because no one can be an effective educator if you can't be in the classroom. So that's really my personal strategy, and it's to varying degrees, right? Like sometimes I just have to teach the sociology of whatever, email Durkheim, and like that's just going to happen. But I can teach it in a way that changes the way that people think and to try to promote the higher order thinking, to use the term Jared was using earlier from that piece of writing, right? To try to promote critical thinking, to try to promote creating students that are capable and have the skills of viewing the world in a different way and being able to take and digest information and come to their own conclusions. And Jared and I are very passionate about like, we aren't trying to convince our students of anything. We are merely giving them information so that they develop the skills to make their own conclusions. Because the vast majority of people come, being churned out by the K through 12 education in the United States do not have the skills to be able to objectively ingest information, digest it, process it, and make their own conclusions about it because they've never been given the other side of any story, really. They've only been given one cohesive myth through their entire academic career. Fire. I can't follow that up, but I'll try. Um, no, that was really good. Um, in terms of like history teaching, since that seemed to be what the question was, and that's what I do, I teach history. You know, I definitely, I'll teach... Howard Zinn is, is, is an inspiration in that whole, you can't be neutral, but like, here's the thing, like the idea is that depending on what narrative that I am engaged in, I will basically try and approach it from the point of view that challenges the pervasive dominant discourse of that time. So if I am teaching a U.S. history course, I will provide materials, um, primary sources that are from women, people of color, First Nations, uh, the Latinx community, uh, 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 the LGBTQ plus community, I will provide those narratives because those are not the dominant narratives that people have learned in the K through 12 system. And through those narratives, we'll hear about oppression and we'll make um, certain people in the classroom feel uncomfortable or guilty because of what their ancestors did to these other groups of people. But, but we'll also teach about all of the forms of agency and resistance that all of these groups um, um, brought to the table as well. And we'll try and learn from those. And in all of that, and in teaching like the other side of the story and different quote unquote alternative facts is what some people might call them, or presenting my material in a certain way, we will be challenging the celebratory ethically constitutive story of the United States. Um, Continuing on that, um, I focus a lot on international um, uh, history as well. And what I, I, I really strive to do is teach those histories in a as celebratory, but also critical manner as possible, um, as long as it's as 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 long as it can be perceived as like I'm not being too 
quote unquote, uh, subjective in what facts I'm choosing. Because if I'm going to critique the United States, I also need to be able to critique, I don't know, whatever, France or Mozambique or <laughs> Cambodia the same way. But the fact that I actually want to introduce students to these other places and their rich histories of good, bad, and ugly, I think in a way, in and of itself, is subversive and challenging, of course, the Western dominant discourse um, as it exists. Merely teaching a student about the rich history of a place uh, like Kenya's uh, passion project or of a Mexico or um, of a Vietnam or any of these other places, right? Like that in and of itself is challenging the dominant discourse of the time. Like this is a history that matters. And, and for a lot of people, especially when we're talking about a global history, that's, they don't matter. And I'm using that word, that term don't matter very specifically based on a, a recent, um, uh, you know, social movement that's been going on. Africa is one of my favorite examples. First and foremost, you ask a lot of students on their first, first couple of days and, and they try, you know, you ask them what is Africa and, and, and half of them are still telling me it's a country, not a continent, full of so many hundreds of different languages and beliefs and cultures. And, all, and so they believe the whole damn thing's one, one, one country. That right there is just shows what, what's being produced right now. But once you like dig into it and you think about it, and I always, I mean, I can even ask Nick as like my sounding board on this. How many history classes did you have on the history of Africa going through the K through 12 system? Um, how many? How many did you have? I can't remember a single one. Okay. And the difference between Kenya and Tanzania and Uganda and Sierra Leone mm -hmm. and Ghana and Mali and uh, the list goes on, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, nothing. South Africa, Zimbabwe, you know, nothing. Here's the thing. Most of these courses, like most people have never even learned about the history of Africa before the transatlantic slave trade. And they're lucky to receive that at all, but they do. What we're insinuating by, and this is just like my straw man argument here. I'm not, this happens all around the world. I'm just using Africa as the argument. But what we're insinuating is in the grand history of humanity, how we got here by ignoring this entire continent. Again, the literal birthplace of homo sapiens up until white people came there and oppressed them, what we're insinuating is that history doesn't matter. And if we're insinuating that that history did not matter, what are we insinuating about the ancestors of those people? Right, also does not matter. That's not a large, that's not a leap. That's not a jump at all, especially when we're willing to go back in depth and learn about the great white ancestors of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And oh my God, all of the super boring medieval kings. And, and we're willing to make like fantasy shows about it. And like, oh God, it's just out of control. Absolutely out of control. Mm -hmm. Out of control. Yeah, you, I like to tell, I talk to my students a lot about this, like, I was teaching a class on uh, whatever. It doesn't matter what the class was about, but I brought up Gandhi as an example of something. And literally there was one person that knew who Gandhi was. This was like a freshman class in a university. And like my mind was just absolutely blown. Just the limited amount of education that people are getting at this they, point. And they think it's all just like, again, it's part of the myth making, the celebratory narrative, the wrongful omission that one culture and one type of people have dominated everything on the planet for so long. It's out of control. You tell people algebra is an Arabic term and that its, its origins are in the Middle East or that the number system's origins are in India or that uh, many modern Western philosophies actually were taking place in the African kingdom of Mali at a place called Timbuktu. And Europeans would send their scholars to learn from Africans just before the transatlantic slave trade kicked off. And it blows their damn minds. The printing press was in Korea uh, centuries before it was in, um, what is it, Germany? Whatever, Europe. Right, they, th these are the things that are just completely overlooked in the manufacture and celebration of one way of thinking, one type of people. Uh, the list goes on and on. So back to what I, how I started this, when I'm teaching a world, uh, more worldly histories, whatever class that might be in, nation building or resistance and revolution, that's what I'm focusing on, right? I go back and sometimes Nick even gets mad that I go so far back in some of my context building for like revolutions and stuff. But for me, that's the reason I go so far back into like these histories and contexts is because it's, it might not be so crucial to understand for a revolutionary movement that took place in 2011, for example. But for me, it's my way of letting people know that like, here's a whole backstory that you've never heard of. Here's a whole history. And it's a hell of a lot older than 250 years. Well, I mean, and the sad thing is that you can't start the conversation in modern times because the education of ancient history is so limited. 
that, that you have to start from day one, basically, and like, right, like, not even just ancient, about, but international history. No, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So if I do, if we teach the U.S. War for Independence, that's the one I have to do the least backstory on for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. But when we do uh, the Mau Mau Rebellion in Kenya, dude, I, I, like most people can't even, most of these, most people can't find Kenya on a map. So I'm, I feel like, you know, like that, that right there is a great indicator of how little we're learning. Um, but if I ask them to find a France or a Germany or an England on a map, they're pretty good to go. That right there shows the bias inherent in the system. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, I want to move forward and just kind of finish up this episode. Okay, so, so that, I don't know what kind of advice that gives to Zed. Well, I have the philosophy. I'm going to give them my philosophy okay, real quick. Ahead. So it's super quick. I've, I've thought about this. They made me write it down once. So I'm going to read from it. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's super long and boring, just maybe like the first and last paragraph. But okay, so this is the philosophy that I bring into teaching history. My teaching philosophy springs from the point of departure that students and teacher are in this process together. Thus, I'll often use we in the following descriptions. We operate under the notion that when we peel back all the layers in modern academics and get down to the actual foundation of education, the practice is truly about a teacher and a learner. We're the only requirement for learning to take place. Everything else is excess. That includes admin, that includes, H, that includes all of them, excess. The famed 13th century poet philosopher Rumi better encompasses this essence. Out beyond the ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there's a field, I'll meet you there. The central aim of my approach is the delivery of a quality learning experience that encourages students to question. I ask them to challenge all assumed knowledge, to question prevailing ideologies, to question prior educational encounters, to even question what they hope to gain from their college investment. We start all coursework under the auspices that if students entered college hoping to have everything they think they know about the world merely reinforced, our discourse may be a much needed wake up call. I believe nothing of any consequence comes from a place of comfort and it is my role uh, to create discomfort. Yeah, Jared uses that quote on day one of every one of our classes, right? That nothing from any of any consequence comes from a place of comfort. And we as educators in the classroom, our job is to essentially make you uncomfortable because if we're just telling you what you wanna hear, there's no point. Right. We want to tell you the things that you've never heard that are going to challenge what you feel and what you believe and make you feel uncomfortable. So then at the end of the class, you can be a different person. Right. You've at least heard challenging ideas and experienced different ways of thinking and knowing and being and so forth. You've at least experienced that and have hopefully developed a different way of thinking. Yeah, we're think trying to like we're fostering agency in students to take like more active roles in their education in their lives and in the world like essentially i mean at the bare minimum i mean we want them to like just leave the course with an open mind but like but with the mindset and tools to take our collective trajectory seriously our all of humanity's shoot everyone knows how i feel about animals like the whole planet's collective trajectory seriously so yes that's 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 one of the things that we're seeking to do at least and like we we construct our assignments to reflect these goals, right? So like very rarely, only in my intro class do they have like a multiple choice exam or something. And the, the vast majority of assignments are like personal reflection assignments, right? Like why do you think that you had never been taught this history? Or, you know, what ideology do you, like we just, in our ideology class, right? What ideologies of the colonizers conflicted with the ideology of the colonized specifically, and how did that interaction take place, et cetera, right? To make them really think about what they're learning and relate it to their own lives and their own ways of knowing and being and thinking about the world. So we structure our entire classes that way. And every single one of our joint classes that we co-teach, the culmination is a group project where they're have to they're creating something out of nothing, right? So they have to create a new ideology or create a social movement that's hypothetical and what would they do and et cetera. So we really structure our whole classes that way. And just like an in classroom style thing, we both teach from like basically the Socratic method. So it's a lot of like back and forth and much less just like lecturing at our students, but really getting their feedback throughout. And that's just really important for us. So I want to try to like address Zev as becoming a K through L K through eight teacher with a strong bent towards libertary social studies education. Really the best advice I can give you is you're going to have to do the work that you're not going to like very clearly of like preparing students for standardized education, et cetera. But your task is really to f make the time and fit in the education that they would not have normally gotten if you would have just put on a film 
right? If I was going to give you a strategy, it'd be like to minimize everything that you have to do so that you can create the gaps where you can insert the education that you think is really, really important for them to become critical thinkers and to challenge the status quo, I think is the best thing that you can do. To make sure that they end up being so much more than somebody that can properly fill out an application to be a cashier at a retail chain. And they don't know this at the time, and the education system seems to have missed this fact, but if you can be successful at that, they will end up being more successful in their careers, regardless of what discipline they go into, whether it's software development or teaching, or what, I don't care what they are, critical thinking is valuable in absolutely any field. And uh, we just, the education system just does not value it because it's hard to systematize. All right, anything else? No, man, that was longer than we wanted to go. Uh, hopefully, uh, whoever else found this interesting, cool, shoot us some comments um, on your thoughts. Uh, hopefully, we didn't, uh, no, no, bullshit. Hopefully, we ruffled some feathers. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, that's all. It's, it's definitely a very different episode. There was no structure, rhyme, or reason to it. We just really wanted to address this question. So, uh, yeah, sorry if it was a little bit all over the place, but we did all right. We did all right. Take us out. So I have been forgetting in our recent episodes to thank our Patreon supporters every single time, which we absolutely cannot forget. Um, you guys really, really help us find motivation to do this. If you like what we do, you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash revolution and ideology. And like we've been saying throughout, this question came specifically from one of our Patreon supporters. So you can get on Patreon and send us a message as well. And uh, we will address that too. So thank you to our Patreon supporters. I'm Nick. Jared. Later.